In the evolution of scientific discovery, one outstanding genius appears every 100 years, whose contributions elevate the passage of humankind to a higher order. Sir Isaac Newton, 18th century. Thomas A. Edison, 19th century. Albert Einstein, 20th century. Momus Alexander Morgus, 21st century. I've got it all over me. I know the whole place is contaminated. Oh, gee. Oh, well, uh, yes, well, I've got the uh, de-radioactivity ingredients uh, somewhere around here. Oh, yes, sir. And herein, we celebrate the first 50 years of his story. It all started in 1958, when a local television station discovered a young genius, Momus Alexander Morgus, working in his laboratory above the old city ice house in the historic French Quarter of New Orleans. Upon seeing his incredible discoveries and meeting his two peerless assistants, Chopsley, a faceless giant of a man, and Eric, a cyborg A, deceased former assistant whose brain remained alive within a molecular integrated circuit computer. The station negotiated with him to set up remote cameras in his lab and telecast his live experiments. This, ladies and gentlemen, became the first reality show in the course of television history. Come with us as we take a close examination at what was and what still is the mystery of Morgus. It was the biggest thing New Orleans TV had ever seen. Morgus had a magnificent mind. His ideas are light years ahead of what other scientists have, have been thinking. It was absolute genius. New Orleans is known for great pairs, Morgus and Chopsley. Unbelievable how popular Dr. Morgus was in New Orleans. Growing up in New Orleans in the 50s and 60s, it was a more laid back time. Eisenhower was president. Of course, you had the nuclear bombs going off everywhere and that kind of put the, the fear of God into people. But that also gave birth to the uh, re-release of all the universal horror movies in black and white. They had already purchased a package of films for the shock lab lab library. You had no way of seeing these movies, and it didn't look like we ever would. But we kind of figured, gee, it would be kind of nice to have a host. And then on January 3rd, 1959, along came Morgus, and it was a dream come true. Morgus is a scientist. He's not uh, not a television person, or certainly not in 1959. Television was very popular for programs that originated in the studio. We had to get the right look that we wanted, and uh, so we went out down on Dryad Street and bought a lot of props for Dr. Morgus. I was a senior at John McDonough High School in New Orleans, and. I had built up somewhat of a reputation as being a, uh, an amateur scientist. I'd won a number of science fairs. Everybody was building telescopes. I and friends were building telescopes from scratch, getting in mirrors and polishing them. And, uh, we were doing science experiments. We were building rockets. Now, all of us built rockets that would try to find the best fuel and go to a field and shoot it up, and they'd blow up, and we'd get hurt. And, but that was the fun. You know, everyone did that. We were part of the age. My, uh, my little efforts in science came to the attention of the good Dr. Morgan. Welcome to Morgan's Presents. Oh, uh, well, uh, well, our friend Delaney uh, seems to be uh, left holding the bag. <laughs> Well, of course, there's nothing like losing your best girlfriend during working hours, I always say. <laughs> you know, if I was Delaney, I'd take home some of those furnishings. Man, pow. You know, that was just, it, it just caught on it's overnight. Saturday night, when I go for my date, my baby and I just sit and wait for 
magnificent. As soon as the House of Shock took off, and it was only a matter of, of a few weeks of being on the air, that all of a sudden everybody was saying, hey, did you see what Morgus did last week on the House of Shock? The 10.30 hour, everybody would stop and just pile into the living room or whoever house it was at and watch. Morgus. Magnificent. The whole city watched it. I mean, uh, everywhere you went, the next day you'd say, did you see Morgus? Did you see Morgus? If you weren't there on Saturday night watching, you missed it. And that was a horrible thing, because if you missed it, then you'd hear all your friends talking about it, and you couldn't participate, you were in the out crowd. So everybody watched it on Saturday Argus. night. Magnificent. We used to like to go to the Sacred Heart dances on Saturday night, which would be from, as I recall, 7 till 10. And when you're 12 years old, 13 years old, you like to go where the action is, you know? However, by 10.30, we had to be back at home watching television, and there was Morgan. Everybody was talking about it when you got back to school, or your friends would call you up, you know, your close friends, and say what was going on, you know, on the show. You'd be talking about it on Sunday morning, and it was always something that kept you abuzz, and it was definitely part of the entertainment, uh, you know, staple of all your friends back in school. Did you see this guy on TV? Vargas, the magnificent. I feel sorry for the younger people who really don't know him as, as I do, as the older people in the city do, because I think he's a larger-than-life character. You know, he's, he's real in so many ways. One night he had a movie on called The Snow Creature, which was about the abominable snowman of the Himalayas. And this was one of the first indications of how popular the show had become. Because we invited everybody, this was live television then, of course, and we invited everybody to come down. Because at 12 o'clock tonight, we're going to have the snow creature here on the roof of the Channel 4 building, which he did. And we thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice if a hundred or so people came? There were people as far as the eye could see. And on the roof of the building, there's Morgus and Chopsley fighting a, a dummy that's uh, made up to look like the abominable snowman, and they beat him up and threw him off the roof and down into the people, and the people went wild. Argus. Magnificent. Well, I think it was one of the biggest crowds that the New Orleans Police Department ever had encountered. There were thousands of people that were driving. They tied up all the traffic at midnight on a Saturday night. We knew at that point in time this was not just a hit in New Orleans. It was a mega hit. Nothing's going to happen. Now, uh, we'll use uh, one part of this hand. I guess we'll use the thumb since it's uh, kind of swollen there. That way we won't miss. Now, I have connected this hemostat to this wire, which is connected to the electro motor, which drives this utility fan. I just want you to touch that, Chosley, with the thumb there. Very lightly. Pick it up. <laughs> It does. It, it works. Watch your head. Watch your head, you idiot. You'll cut it off. Watch. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. <laughs> when they started the House of Shock on TV, I was 12 years old. And uh, it, was, it was like a dream come true because I was aware at that time that they had already released this universal studios packages of old horror movies and there was of course a lot of dracula movies and then there were monster movies vampires these were grade z movies they were playing they had about four or five really good you know godzilla and a few movies like that uh you know the mummy a few good horror movies but by and large they were bad horror movies it didn't matter what the movie was. People watched it for Morgus, not the movie. 
Dr. Morgus was running that movie for you, and you were totally into whatever he was doing, which always tied in to the movie. If it was Frankenstein, he was making a, a Frankenstein. The only show in my lifetime where I think you watch the show for the intermission and not the meat of the show. So many times the movies were really bad. You know, they, they weren't worth watching. But Morgus was worth watching. And that was the key of what I think the success of Morgus became is the fact that, you know, people watch movies they've seen a million times just to get to see Morgus again. That was the highlight. I mean, forget the movie. If you wanted ice cream or something, go get the ice cream while the movie was going on. You know, make sure you don't miss the five-minute breaks when Morgus was doing his experiments. That, that's what was so incredible. And possibly it was kind of fun because you were part of it. His performances were not Academy Award type of performances. They, they, were, they were more off the cuff and family entertainment. This thing can disintegrate an entire nation. Anything in it, well, I have a place to completely detach. Now touch this, touch that ball. Touch it. That's it. Hold it tight. Hold it tight. Perfect. Perfect. All right, let, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Oh, that's terrific. Terrific. Oh, this is too much. I could hear everything just like it was my own. <laughs> oh yes, let's let's uh, let's think that we should get back now and wrap up our story of the uh, phony face scientist. Uh, by the way, I think phony face is about ready to be picked up right now. It was live television. So everything we did was happening right then and there. And sometimes things just didn't go as you particularly planned them to go. There is nothing wrong with your TV set. This is a special report. The mystery of Morgus. At the beginning, there were no videotaping of shows. They were absolutely live. So if anything went wrong, you had to cover it. And you had to be very creative. But you didn't have big production staffs as we do today. It was very low budget. And the success of a show pretty much depended on the primary character, in this case, Morgus. We were live, no tape, no days. No. It was by the seat of your pants. So everything we did was happening right then and there. And sometimes things just didn't go as you particularly planned them to go. I mean, it's hard to believe this stuff happened and it was not faked, it was not staged. What are you doing? Ow! Oh, what are you gonna try to do? But these weren't stunt guys doing this. This was Morgus and Chopsley. I'd take the script and I'd read it and they would say, Morgus, Morgus does da 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 and Chopsley does that. <laughs> because a lot of it was unscripted, unexpected. And that's what made it fun. I remember one of the shows that we were doing live on a Saturday night, uh, as we were doing one of the experiments. And he's walking around, and as, you know, he's bumbling around, and then all of a sudden, his shoulder hits the center section. The entire set in the background fell down. And there he was, right in the middle, obviously, of a TV studio. Spare cameras, cables, lights hanging from the ceiling, props from all the other shows, the kids' shows, the dance shows. We were in a state of horror. The night he had uh, a lizard, and he was going to in, in, inject the lizard with some kind of Margusel serum that was going get to the, get the lizard to grow into an alligator. Well, Chopsley uh, went to approach the alligator and the alligator just up and whomped Chopsley in his thigh with his big old tail he probably not as drugged as he thought he was and Chopsley went sprawling into the set and knocked down part of the set well everybody it's live TV so everybody thought this was supposed to happen but it didn't it wasn't supposed to happen it just happened and Morgus just went on as though nothing was wrong and well oh, that always happens you know those idiots in the construction department you know Morgus just didn't change a thing he just went on and on and on and we're going this is weird you know we have to pretend like in his mind it's still there 
And then he finally said, and now let's go back to our feature presentation. August just ad-libbed the whole thing, and he gave, you know, fortunately the people that were working with him, and he pick up the line, and, and as long as it's close. Fortunately, you know, he, he just never let anything get in his way of, of trying to, to showcase his experiments every, uh, every week. He really thought out exactly what he was doing. And just from being on the show those three times, he ran a tight show. Morgus had been outfitted with a metal plate shield and on top of that a layer of foam. But it exposed the, the sleeves and a, a little bit of the chest. Well, anyway, for the final scene, where Morgus, something's going wrong, and the bad guy's gonna shoot Morgus. And what was to happen was that someone off camera had a real arrow with a, with a steel point on it. Behind the cameras is this professional archer. Draws back the arrow, lets it go. And the arrow went straight into Morgus' ribs. And, I mean, it was hard to fake it. And Morgus lets out with this horrible scream. What an actor. He is really good. And but he starts limping, and oh, man, and then he falls over dead. It was r so realistic. He was really hurting, but he couldn't say, stop, stop the show, I'm dying, because it's live TV. But then when he finally said, you know, he dies, and that's the end of the show, he says, get me to the hospital, I've been shot. Oh, well, uh, yes, well, I've got the uh, de-radioactivity ingredients uh, somewhere around here. Oh, yes, uh, well, let's, let's just get back right now to... Uh, a very sick at, uh, atomic man in, in the story. Uh, I think uh, I think there's still some action going on around him. Two local entrepreneurs, uh, Jules Savan and Eugene Cologne, owners of the Bell Theater and the Gallo Theater, approached Morgus about making a movie. But they decided to make the Morgus film, which was shot various locations throughout the New Orleans and greater New Orleans area. I live near the Bell Theater, and the Bell Theater was made by, uh, was owned by the Savants, which, which did the movie. So it was kind of a neighborhood project. Everybody put their everything into the film, and, uh, and frankly, when it was finished and first viewed, everybody was very satisfied with the, with the film. screened regionally to moderate success. I think they did a very fine job. Uh, obviously, they couldn't produce anything on the scale of Hollywood and Gone with the Wind. All right, put it up there. Right down into the lawn. To the left. I mean the right. I mean the left. That's good. <laughs> now I'll take over. I remember scenes on Canal Street as it was then. The film was not a tremendous financial success, but uh, I think they were proud of what they had done, what they had succeeded with local production. <laughs> I don't believe it. No woman, no woman would ever leave me. You see, that's something you never did realize. <laughs> Any woman that ever came into the realm of my affections would never leave me. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> You are kidding, right? Stop. If I leave you here for a couple of days, you mean to tell me you let her go off? You mean she ran off with that monkey? You're lying to me. You're lying to me. Idiot. Morgus did not get into this to be a star. He didn't get into it to make appearances at Pontchartrain Beach and uh, do uh, photo ops at grocery stores. He got into this to save the world. And things in New Orleans were 
really not conducive to that. He was being treated like a pop star when in fact he was a scientist. So he needed to get away. He needed a change of, change of scenery. He needed to refocus. He went to Detroit. This is a special report. The mystery of Morgus. He felt he needed a change of scenery. Um, so he hightailed it out of New Orleans up to Detroit where he resumed his, his experiments and did the weather. Well, when he went off the air, it was sort of like a death. You couldn't handle it. It's like no longer were you entertained on the weekend. And he went to Detroit, and it was on television there. But if you watch Morgus there, it's not quite the Morgus we know here. <laughs> Just going through my fan mail I got today. Let's see here. Dear Dr. Morgus, I watch your scientific program because it helps me. He first showed up here in Detroit uh, with a weather show, which was a, a five-minute program oh, consisting of a short experiment, a weather forecast, a and uh, as usual, his experiments no. blew up on him at the last second. No! No! The program was called Morgus and the Weather. It was a five-minute show that began at 5.55 p.m. before the 6 o'clock news. The hair and everything was kind of tamed down. I mean, he wasn't the, the wild, mad scientist we knew here. It ran in that form for a couple of months before they decided to uh, reproduce the Morgus Presents experience that was uh, started down in New Orleans. Well, I'm not going to stay up here very long. He was a big hit everywhere. Um, the local personalities clamored to be on the program, and uh, it also sparked a lot of controversy because he was airing against Steve Allen at the time, who had a very popular, may have even been The Tonight Show at that point. As a result of that controversy, Steve Allen actually made an appearance on the program one night uh, during the Instant People Machine. Morgy. Morgy! We'll be back in just a minute, folks. I think he's left us. So after a year in Detroit, I think, I think maybe the doctor started to miss red beans and rice and beignets, and then he decided it was, it was time to come home. I was going to call a television station here. They're running a little late here. You know, I'm a busy scientist. I can't play around with these waiting around here, holding up for some television station to pick up my scientific weather show. You know, I mean, I, I got to make money here. I got all... So Dr. Morgus returned from Detroit with his new invention, color television. For all the movies that we saw in the House of Shock, some of their and my favorite moments was when he did the weather. Smorgas Board, which was Morgus's weather show, which ran for, as I recall, five minutes at 4.55 until 5 o'clock till the news came on every afternoon during the week. Morgus had this theory, and it still holds today. This is how brilliant a man Morgus is. He had this theory that all people really care about with the weather is what's it like now and what's it going to be like tomorrow. They don't care about isobars and fronts coming down from Seattle or things like that. They just, you know, give me the dope of what's happening now. And that's what we did on the show, and we did it as fun. The weather show would come on at 5 to 5, followed by the news at 5 o'clock. The best part of the weather, and many people remember this, was the humidity rate. And he had basically a bucket, a pail, that, you know, you used to mop floors with. It had water in it and an old towel. And he would reach down, take out this silly towel. He squeezed it and saw how much water dropped out, and he knew how high the humidity was. And say, 82% humidity. And it was sheer genius. He had, of course, his uh, Morgus's weather vane, where he predicted the weather from his vane. That was great, because you had Morgus back. He had this machine that would shake, rattle, and roll. And then the, uh, the weather forecast would be superimposed over the screen of his uh, machine. And, uh, you know, coming home from school, great stuff to watch. And, you know, we'd take Morgus any way we could get him back then. The weather on TV, to me, was phenomenal. For somebody like me who really doesn't appreciate three segments of weather, you know, the first weather, the second weather, the third, fourth, fifth, how many weathers they give you and just repeat the same thing, 
Morris came on and the weather was done, it seemed to me, in about 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, oh, hello there, my friends of science. <laughs> oh, I hope you have your notebooks handy today because I think I am on the brink of discovering the secret to the solid molecule. <laughs> oh, somebody's knocking already. Always disturbances. Yes, what is it? Wait. Oh, what is it? Do not be frightened, Doctor. You are not seeing things. What, what is I it? I am an invisible man. An invisible man? <laughs> Do not look to be too surprised either, because I think you also are nearing the discovery of the colorless molecule. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm working on it, but, but, but what are you Never doing? Never mind the questions, Doctor. I came here for your help. I can't return to a visible state because part of my memory disappeared with me and I can't calculate the formula for reinstatement. As a young kid, I can remember myself, once I understood how the world worked, calling WWL, calling uh, WDSU and saying, hey, where's Morgus? Can you bring Morgus back? Do you have any films you can play of Morgus? We need Morgus. And he came over to WDSU TV and I inherited Morgus. I was afflicted with him. I was affiliated with him and uh, stayed with him for about 30 years. So I was a floor director or a stage manager, so it was on my shift, so I got to work on the show. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun in those days. It was uh, very challenging, but very rewarding. But when we put it on Saturday night, we had reports that the sales of pizzas almost tripled in, in, in New Orleans. Oh, boy, we had a busy day today. Oh, mailman. Oh, thank you very much, sir. All right. <laughs> Let's see, from the... <laughs> it just says Weather Bureau, New Orleans. There were no scripts to a Morgus episode. The entire show was in Morgus's head. And that man is one of the most talented comedians I have ever known. The doctor would run. He would run from one end to the other. And not only horizontally but vertically and run at the camera and you know you know you're racking that focus and unfortunately we had a couple of really good camera guys that could do that okay <laughs> didn't work <coughs> uh, now look uh, it may take a little oh, now wait 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 a minute i say it may take a little, little while oh, what are you doing wait wait what are you doing what are you doing oh what are you gonna try to do oh look give me a break here hey wait wait you know the people are watching they'll call they'll call the police you know you can't do this. I happen to be a well-known scientist around this town. <laughs> you... <laughs> Hello, police. Oh. Send the wagon right away to the old city ice house. There's a maniac running wild on the top floor. The inventions that uh, I made for Morgus uh, was approximately maybe 40 to 50 uh, inventions, and I had to do it within one week. There is nothing wrong with your TV set. This is a special report. The mystery of Morgus. Morgus's experiments were so involved and so elaborate and had so much, you know, breakthrough equipment and technology involved that he knew that he needed somebody that would would be an assistant to it. The funny part is, if you talk to any native New Orleanian about Morgus, it's like they know it, you know? It's like, oh yeah, Morgus and Chopsley. Chopsley was the more intelligent of the two. <laughs> Chopsley, you idiot, you paleologic moron. Um, that, that is something that everybody remembers. My uh, biggest memory of Chopsley was his size. He actually was not faking it, not wearing platform shoes. Along came this wonderful six foot six, or however tall Chopsley was, uh, man, uh, you know, with his big axe and his hood. Chopsley was an enormous guy. When he'd shake my hand, I would think his thumb was about as big around and bigger than these four fingers together. I don't think people appreciate the part Chopsley played. His mannerisms and his, the way he just moved and what he did in the background. If you really watch the shows and watch him, he was a genius. 
He complimented the doctor perfectly. The kindest, most gentlest guy you'd ever want to meet. To me, he looked seven feet tall. He was probably more like six, seven or something. Six, eight, who knows? I uh, had the f very great fortune of playing Topsley for a while. Didn't talk, so of course it enabled Morgus to be able to continue to expound all of his scientific theories to the audience. This thing was like six feet tall, you know? It was, it was so, it, it's so integral to to Morgus in New Orleans. He had Chopsley out there snatching bodies and dragging them back in. I remember many shows where he had real people laying there as bodies and he was working on people that went and got Chopsley to go get people from the graveyard. He'd get people from a bus stop because it put him in the city and it put him doing real things. You know, Chopsley shopping at Pugliese Meat Market and bringing something home from the London Avenue Canal for Morgus to experiment on. Chopsley's always loyal to the master and then to be asked to do something against the master was totally just foreign. But I remember Chopsley had all these watches on his wrist, and he was going to make a fortune by selling all these watches, and, and Morgus said, you're crazy, you're not going to do it. Morgus was wrong, and, you know, Chopsley made a fortune selling his watches. Chopsley was always hungry, right? I'd, I'd eat wallpaper and such, and I'd just feed him, <laughs> feed me. He, he did the Man from Space thing where he put all his this god-awful looking goop that he made, you know, out of squished bananas and so forth, into hospital gloves and, and put the hospital gloves on his thing. And of course, Chopsley's drooling all this time. Going, oh, I <laughs> Chopsley brought something back from the London Avenue Canal. I mean, you can just almost picture Chopsley down there looking in the canal, seeing something, and how did he get it back to the lab? I had to, to constantly keep in mind to underplay what I did. I did some not, not wild and flailing and so forth. Just be very understated, you know, and uh, more than likely in character. And he became a fixture, and, and he became almost as popular as Morris. I mean, nobody could become as popular as Morris, but Chopsley was, was pretty close up there, and he was a wonderful man. I tried to emulate what Tommy had started. He was Chopsley. I only stood in for him. I want you to see what I am offering for the betterment of mankind. <laughs> there it is. The more guffle perpetual cardio machine. <laughs> Marcus came to me about 1987 or so, in the late 80s. And he says, Phil, I need someone to work on my inventions. And uh, you think you could squeeze it into your business? I said, work for Morgus? I'll close the businesses down and, and, and do your work, you know? I said, I'll be happy to do that. <laughs> the, the inventions that uh, I made for Morgus uh, was approximately maybe 40 to 50 uh, inventions. and. I had to do it within one week, because every Friday, without fail, we had to have an invention. There it is. Somehow I managed to, to get what he was talking about, and he looked like he was satisfied with everything. Matter of fact. When I was working on these machines, uh, I had to do all the electronics, if there was any, and mechanical things. Now, I'm, I'm going to try something here. <laughs> This Chopsley here has been a little, a little too big for his pants, you know. He's always looking down at me. It doesn't look good for an assistant to be bigger than his master. So I'm just going to try to inject. He made some kind of a uh, lexia or something. Just a little injection in the veins here. All right, oh, there we go. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't bother me now. I watch, I'll probably grow a little. Well, oh, grow. It made it become a giant. Oh, I'm stretching. I've blown up. Good. Good heavens. He became twice his size. So to make it look like he was twice his size, I had to make a set. I'm a giant. I had to Jump. scale it all down 50%. Jump. 
I spent a lot of time on them, and, but each and every one of them, at the end of the, each uh, show, they all would fail. So I don't know if that gives me any credit all, at all. I don't know, but I had fun doing them. I really did. He said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Within six months, they were back on TV on Channel 6 with Morgus Presents. This is a special report. The mystery of Morgus. I want to show you how you are going to be able to see into the sixth dimension. You got it ready, Charlie? In 1981, when I was on WTIX, we decided to have a Halloween promotion, and we were thinking, what could we do? And I said, well, why don't we see if we can find the Morgus movie and bring that back and uh, give it to the people for free. Originally, it was going to be one showing on Halloween night. The demand was so big, we had to show it twice on Halloween night. And the demand was even bigger than that. We had to show it the next night twice. And the theater was packed every time, and we still had to turn people away for the wacky world of Dr. Morgus. People came out by the hundreds. It was standing room only, and, and Morgus, who had essentially disappeared for the better part of a decade, took notice of this, and he thought, maybe it's time to turn those cameras back on. In the 1980s, I started working for the library, and most of the staff of the library was involved in science fiction conventions. And I started going to the conventions, and it was at the 1986 uh, a convention in the summer that I met Robert Fuller, and he was asking me about uh, what would we think about Dr. Ward is coming back. And I said, that would be fantastic. Chopsley asked him, come on, when are we going to do it again? You know, people are ready, when are we going to do it? And he says, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Good evening. Welcome to Morgus Presents. Within six months, they were back on TV on Channel 6 with Morgus Presents. Uh, my job in the 80s was to figure out how to do all the special effects. And usually it wasn't a whole bunch of warning. <laughs> the doctor would say, we're going to do this. I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to die. And I'm going to leave my body. He's going to stay here on the floor. And I'm going to get up and do the rest of the show. We did effects in the 80s that we couldn't even, we couldn't even thought about in the 60s. I mean, it was just unbelievable, the difference in technical ability. The reaction to Morgus's reappearance on the airwaves was phenomenal, and the buzz was very intense. Still is. He's one of the most uh, loved and cherished icons of the city. But listen, Wiley, uh, uh, Dr. Bottomley is coming over here to sign my death certificate. <laughs> I know, I know, but you see, uh, no, I'm going to die right now. Uh, well, look, I, 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 I can't explain very... I can't... I, I, uh, hurry, Chopsley. Chopsley. Get me in there right away. Get me in there. Pull me, Chops. Hurry. Hurry. Help me. Uh, hurry. I'm not going to... Uh, wait there, friends. Everything will be okay. You'll see. I'll come right out of my body once I... once I fade away. Oh, I'm, I'm already feeling lighter. I feel... And I'm very proud of the work we did, uh, especially the stuff we did in the, in the 80s. We did some really cool effects. Good heavens. What a funny feeling. What? Kind of flying by the seat of our pants, not really having a plant, chance to plan them out and practice them. And, you know, we just took it off and, and went. The stuff of them worked pretty good. Oh, you're the rest of the bowling team? Yeah, I'm, I'm Henry. This is my wife, Patsy. Oh, hi there, Patsy. I was in the Instant People Machine program. There were four of us, and we were going to go through the Instant People Machine. And as you know, we, we're going to put you all together, and we'll send you down to Mexico City. All of a sudden, I feel this grip on my ankles, and I felt myself being tipped over, and whoop, slide in. I went down in. All right, let's turn it on. Don't worry about it, Henry. Morgus did uh, a thing on MTV, on Mardi Gras Day, on one of the balconies in Bourbon Street. They know who he is. So, uh, Morgus Alexander Morgus. And we've used that footage a number of times. 
when he'd go to the window and look out and it was MTV, all the people screaming, Morgus, Morgus, Morgus. They wrote that into the script a couple of times. Where is it? Morgus's quotes, there's so many. My favorite Morgus quote would have to be, Chopsley, you idiot. I wanted the turkey, not a dog, you idiot. Chopsley, you idiot. Yes, it's you idiot. <coughs> Chopsley, you idiot, you paleologic moron. Albert, you idiot. And it makes me just feel good. You know, he's the only person who can call me an idiot, and I feel complimented by it. Of course, Eric with, yes, master. Yes, Master. 599,000 times, Master. How can you be around me so much and know so little? Some of us were born to lead and some of us were born to serve. Was it Aristotle who said that or was it I? Go stand over there till I blow you up. <laughs> How can you be around me so much and know so little? <laughs> that was his laugh. I'd say what I take away from the whole Morgus experience is it certainly was one of the golden memories of my life in New Orleans, unique to that, and certainly one of the, um, the things you remember most fondly about your childhood. This is a special report. The mystery of Morgus. When the press gets here, Chops is going to give me the shot to revive me, and I'm going to rise from the dead on television. He's always lurking, and that to me is really the mystique. You know, he's still out there. We're not quite sure where, but he's lurking, and that's good. You know, the word legacy is kind of thrown around, but Morgus truly has created a legacy, not only for New Orleans, but for the world through his sheer genius. Morgus is a... Uh, and quite frankly, uh, a, a comedic genius. And I think that he is as New Orleans as red beans and rice. The impression that Morgus made on this city is that you don't need to be handsome. He may have been under the makeup. You don't have to have a big script. You don't have to have a great education. You don't have to be learned. You don't have to go to school for a certain trade to be in showbiz. Morgus is as much of an icon to this city as Dookie Chases, as Endymion, as um, anybody, any place you can think of. I think the biggest impact Morgus has had on the city is it made us laugh. He made us laugh, and not only at him, but at ourselves. A city is based on, I think, what people remember it as being, and part of it is the history of that city the culture if we say the Creole culture well that's very important because that happened over a period of time you can think of construction food clothing history well it's the same way with Morgus is that Morgus happened at a time and people remember it it's still in our minds very much alive but it's part of New Orleans of history one man comes along every hundred years a man whose mind is superior to all others a man who is ahead of his time whose ideas and theories are shunned and scoffed at by those idiots at the university a man that progresses science and technology more than any other scientist of his time and for the 21st century momus alexander morgus is that man Although he's been quiet for many years, he's still out there, working on the fringes of science, boldly exploring those far reaches of our minds that would make most normal men tremble with fear. As you go along your day, be assured that the master is still hard at work. So when you pass by the old city ice house in the heart of New Orleans' French Quarter, pass by with caution, because Chopsley and the doctor may be in need of a test subject. And you? Well, you look like you will do just fine. Because when you least expect him, he'll be back. And this is the mystery of Morgus.
Fox 8 is proudly locally owned.